Welcome to a Prevent Connect podcast, where we explore the prevention of violence against women. This is a project of the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault. My name is Rebecca, and I'm part of an art and activist group called Force Upsetting Rape Culture. We're artists, and we're image makers, and we create image that I think uh, articulate um, certain parts of the issue of sexual violence and rape culture in our country draw light to certain aspects of rape culture while promoting consent and we do these sort of media campaigns that get millions of people talking and capture the public imagination so that piece of people not caring about it we create actions that suck people in and then they can have a deeper conversation or start conversations about it. Um, and we're most widely known, we did a prank on Victoria's Secret where we uh, pretended to be Victoria's Secret promoting a new anti-rape consent themed underwear line. We made a fake website, it went a little viral styles on the internet and got a lot of people talking about consent and the sexual objectification of women. So in the workshop, we use the Victoria's Secret prank as sort of a case study of how we worked with messaging. I'm Brad Perry. I'm from Richmond, Virginia. Uh, for about 11 years, I worked at the Virginia Sexual and Domestic Violence Action Alliance doing primary prevention work. Um, I took some time off to go to grad school for advertising. Now I work at a digital branding agency and I'm a board member at Hollaback and um, also just do some work uh, like this. As in my own history doing this work, uh, I definitely was unfortunately a part of and saw lots of campaigns that just felt like they were talking to ourselves um, in terms of the creative direction of them, like how they looked, how much stuff was on it to digest, the tone of it, I mean, you name it. Um, and what I realized after a, a few years of taking a step back from the work was that that's partly because we don't, we've forgotten what it's like to not know or care about this issue. And mm -hmm. the general public, by and large, definitely does not know a lot about this issue. And unfortunately, a lot of them don't really care because they don't think it pertains to them. Yeah. Um, so um, the, the, to get around that, you have to have a system or, or a process that you can put in place when you're doing a communications campaign to make sure that you're not letting your own sort of curse of knowledge or the, you know, passion blindness keep you from creating an effective campaign. So we kind of broke it down. I used an advertising model because advertising has been, you know, pretty good at communicating things and, and selling ideas and things uh, for the past 100 years or so. So um, I just used the sort of the, the uh, process of creating good advertising that um, I sort of broke it down into four steps. Really good objective, um, a, a clear strategy that has a, a great point of view, um, a creative concept that is bold and brings it to life, and uh, really following through on the execution, making sure that you're, you know, taking everything into account, especially like where you're reaching folks. So starting with objective, um, having a really focused and clear objective is really helpful. Uh, I gave the example of Hollaback. Uh, their, everything in their communications and really their, their organization is it's using the organizational power of the internet to expose and end street harassment. It's street harassment, it's not inside the workplace harassment. It's not you know anything outside of being on the street and being harassed for your gender, your sexual orientation, your race. It's really narrowly focused, and the means by which you're promoting the organization, like their mission, it's it's about using your smartphone, it's about using the internet. So mm -hmm. it's like crystal clear. So when they get offers to like partner up, they can refer back to this nice clear objective of what are we about and what are what are what do we what is our brand we're putting out there. One way that Force did that uh, to still use the Victoria's Secret campaign as an example is our two objectives were one to kind of bring attention to the way that um, Victoria's Secret in particular, but a lot of companies, the way that they objectify women and create this image of like what it means to be a sexy woman is really objectifying and really rapey. And so they had these panties that said sure thing and no peeking, which gives these um, unclear ideas of boundaries as 
what it means to be sexy to young girls and we wanted to highlight that so a really clear way that we did that is on the fake website we had this page that was called then and now and we put their under right next to ours so sure thing was right next to ask first so seeing that sure thing pair of underwear on its own you may or may not make the connection in your mind about why that's rapey you know, putting sure thing on a vagina and treating a vagina like a sure thing. So on the fake Victoria's Secret website, it even went, there was some language that's like, no vagina is a sure thing, ask first, you know, like, and kind of playing with it. Um, so that was one clear objective. And then the other objective was just to get a bunch of people talking about consent, that a lot of people don't even know what consent is, it's not part of our mainstream culture, and the objective was consent needs to be a mainstream idea. It needs to not just be something that, you know, sex experts and educators and anti-rape people talk about it, it needs to be something that teenagers are tweeting about. So in the campaign we did like all of this stuff to really engage people on social media and the people who engaged and were talking about the prank on social media were also talking about consent. So we had this like love consent hashtag and people were hashing about why they love consent and people who maybe wouldn't, you know, normally be professing those things because it came with this like really fun, cool, clever panty prank, they sort of got on the consent bag wagon and it got a bunch of people talking about consent in a more mainstream conversation than consent normally sees. So yeah, you know, making consent a mainstream conversation is like such a interesting and clear objective. It helps to start with an objective that's like that. And it's like, and also going back to what you said about it being limited, it's like we're not teaching those people consent. Like, just because somebody tweeted about consent doesn't yeah. mean that the person that they're having sex with right. that Saturday they're practicing consent. They're probably not. Like, we'll be the first people to admit that, but it's like step one. You right. know, it's just getting people to be like, oh yeah, consent, that's a good idea. And then it's like, alright, well are you actually like talking to people, right. you know, and maybe some people had that experience if they like spent time on the website, like that language was definitely there, but not, I don't think everyone engaged at that depth. It just got them to think a little bit differently. Yeah. Which, so that goes into strategy, which is just that, like what is the, what is the angle you're going to take? So it's not so much the how you're going to bring it to life, that's the, more the creativity piece, but the strategy is really before you start doing any creative ideation thinking about what is the angle that we're gonna take. So a good strategy, I would argue, has a couple of different points. We can just maybe touch on two big ones. Um, one of them is that you're defining who your target audience is, uh, and along with that, you are, you are tapping into them. You are actually going and talking to these people that you're trying to move to some you know, action. So, or at least you're familiarizing yourself with them if you can't talk to them. Um, and it's really easy now online to figure out, okay, where these people hang out? How do they talk about sex, gender, power, relationships? Um, and how, do, how can I get in there and use that and speak their language? Not like it's not literal, like one-to-one, -one, like I want to sound like them, but more mm -hmm. what are the things they get excited about and how do they construct their understanding of sexuality, power, gender, so that I can then hop in there and tweak it to how we are trying to get them to think about it because mm -hmm. you can't really just like throw your thing on them you have to figure out where they are and then pit them hannah broncado is the other half of force and we're both artists in baltimore and we both were doing work around sexual violence and then we got together and we did what we knew how to do as artists and we curated an art show so there was an art exhibition called force on upsetting rape on the culture of rape and so it was an art show with video and quilts and multimedia and performances talking about sexual violence and the culture that surrounds it. Um, and then it started this awesome conversation. We were like, oh, we want this conversation to continue. We'll make the show travel. And so we were contacting art galleries and universities. And then after a while, we had this moment where we looked at each other and we were like, what college student learns how they're having sex from an art exhibition? Actually, this is totally wrong. And so then we started making the underwear, and then we found the Victoria's Secret, and then we sort of found that like online platform. But that was sort of where we started from, which was just two artists doing what we knew how to do about an issue that we cared about, and it sort of took us to where we are now, where we're working on more of a national scale and doing like more media making than curating an art exhibition. You actually spent time and were quite intentional about figuring out, okay, this is how Victoria's Secret talks about it, and these are oh. how college kids, especially college women, relate to Victoria's Secret, so yeah. how can we, if, if our whole thing is 
we're going to pretend like we're Victoria's Secret and contrast what really Victoria's Secret is to what you know it should be. We have to figure out how we can basically fool them into thinking that. Yeah, I mean, it was it was a nut we spent a long time cracking. And we had a lot of bad ideas that, like, for a while, the whole thing was going to be these panty drops. And there wasn't going to be a website. It was just going to be these panty drops, which I joked that, you know, that's the 1992 version. Which is where they put the, the ass first panties in Victoria's Secret stores. So that was going to be the whole action. that, And it's like, how much more impactful is it? Like, you know, people, feminists... And, like, activist-type people would be like, oh, that's cool, like, store drops, we're into that. But it would have been that culture of right. people. But the type of people that we wanted to reach are the type of people that would be excited to think that Victoria's Secret actually did it. Or even, like, just the cleverness of the prank engaged a lot of people. Yeah. Um, the other piece of strategy that is really important to consider, I think, is um, developing a really interesting point of view. Um, and... Rebecca talks about this in terms of like looking for the opportunity. Um, what is bubbling up in culture that you can kind of latch onto? So not just your target audience, but what is going on culturally um, as basically, I mean, your own intuition kind of has to tell you this. And it just kind of by keeping up with, you know, what's going on in pop culture, what's going on in the blogosphere, what's going on in music. Um, and you start to see some things triangulate. And so we were talking about this at lunch about, you know, with Steubenville and Penn State and yeah. Catholic Church, like sexual assault in the in the media and as it's, the discourse in the media is really shifting positively more than I've ever seen in my lifetime. Yeah. that's for sure. Yeah. Um, and so, how can we, you know, create a point of view that, that leverages that opportunity, and how can we um, make people think about sexual violence and preventing sexual violence in a way that uh, it doesn't seem so foreign to them or they think doesn't matter. To them? Yeah, and so one example I talked about with Force is we're doing this project called the Monument Project. And the Monument Project is a call to create a permanent monument in the United States um, to survivors of rape and abuse. Um, and it's sort of using this idea of monuments and memorials as ways that communities can grieve and also that we honor people and create public space for individuals to grieve. Um, and so we are doing temporary actions on the mall where we're installing these temporary monuments. And um, the way that that relates to point of view is it's sort of like, it brings up that sort of American pride and this identity of our country, sort of like helping people and responding, like the way that people respond to natural disasters or respond to any kind of tragedy. There's this cultural zeitgeist of like wanting to help. And then what's happened with rape is that it's been made into this special interest issue, like kind of like we were talking about. So there's not this idea that collectively we all need to band together and help survivors. That's not something that a lot of people think of as their role. And even if there are people who really care about it, I think it's a topic that a lot of people feel like they don't know. They just don't know. They don't know how. They don't know where to begin. They don't know how to talk about it. Da da da. So we're doing this big project where we're making this giant quilt that's going to go on the mall in summer of 2014, and we're collecting blank from people across the country and our goal is to collect 6,000 blankets it will cover the lawn between the monument and the Capitol building and be this huge symbol of Americans standing together to support survivors of rape and abuse and create an image like the pictures of that the pictures of people on that it'll be like the AIDS quote where it's it's symbolic of our country being in a place where it can do that and it's not there yet, but we're creating these sort of avenues, these methods, these ways for people to actually do something about it, but then also these images for people to understand how our country and how our culture can do stuff about it. When we think about point of view and when we think about our creative process, we think about entry points and ways to make the messaging that we're creating really accessible for people. And so the target audience for that project is huge. <laughs> and so it starts, it's kind of starting with something that's like, you know, not everyone pays attention to uh, underwear blogs on Tumblr, but the sort of the big symbols that you learn about in history class, something that pulls on those kinds of strings. Thank you for listening to this Prevent Connect podcast. Prevent Connect is a project of the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault with funding from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The views presented on Prevent Connect are not necessarily the views of the United States government, the CDC, or CalCASA. To learn more about Prevent Connect, visit www.preventconnect.org. For more information about CalCASA's mission or to show your support, visit calcasa.org. That's C-A-L-C-A-S-A 
www.ghostbusters.org.